to spend the next 25 minutes talking about uh, the medical evaluation of child sexual abuse. And I'm hoping at the end that you'll understand the nature of child sexual abuse in India and be aware of the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, commonly called POXA, and its implications for you as a healthcare provider. Be aware of the components of a medical evaluation for suspected child sexual abuse, and then be familiar with the new Child Abuse and Medical Professionals Network that we're setting up. So let's start with something very basic. What is child sexual abuse? Well, according to Indian law, it occurs uh, when any child, male, female, transgender youth under 18, is involved in any penetrative sexual assault or a sexual assault with physical contact, contact with uh, a sexual intent that's not penetrative. But it also includes sexual harassment, threats, uh, exposing a child to child pornography, and involving a child in the production of child sexual abuse materials or child pornography. Sexual abuse in India is a major problem, and probably the best study that's been done on prevalence was published in 2007, and it was a, uh, a national incidence study looking at 13 states and interviewing over or surveying over 12,000 children and 5,000 adults and young adults. They found that about 53% of Indian children experienced some form of child sexual abuse, which is really astounding. But keep in mind that that is any kind of child sexual abuse, including non-contact, sexual harassment type of uh, uh, sexual abuse. But if you look at the severe uh, sexual abuse, that is uh, contact sexual abuse, still 21% are exposed to that. So this is a very major problem. Uh, and almost 6% of children are involved in sexual assault, with boys having a higher incidence than girls. Probably largely due to this study and other factors, uh, the Indian government passed the Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act in 2012. And you'll hear this over and over referred to as POXO. And this has major implications for healthcare providers like you. For one thing, it requires us to mandate a, a report, notify law enforcement whenever we suspect child sexual abuse. We have no choice. We have to notify law enforcement. Now, the parent does not have to go on and have law enforcement open an investigation. They can say, no, I don't want to investigate it. But we, as healthcare providers, must notify law enforcement. And the authorities, uh, if they come across a child who they think has been sexually abused and who needs medical care, they must bring the child to the nearest medical facility within 24 hours. Not necessarily a government facility, that could be your facility, whatever's nearest. And as a healthcare professional, we're obliged to provide uh, medical care, which includes uh, attending to injuries, testing and treating sexually transmitted infections and HIV, offering pregnancy, emergency contraception, uh, et cetera, uh, and referring for mental health. So yeah, this has major implications for people. And I think it probably came as kind of a shock to a lot of healthcare providers because this is a lot of responsibility. But fortunately, uh, the Indian uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare put together a very detailed set of guidelines, which is free and available online. I'd strongly recommend reading this. It's excellently written. Uh, it provides a lot of detail about how to interpret POXO, what the law is, uh, how to uh, interview children, how to do the exam, how to collect evidence. It really takes you through step by step. So let's pretend that you're in your clinic and the mother brings in her 10-year-old daughter who has a history of acute onset genital bleeding and lower abdominal pain. The bleeding has stopped, the pain is intermittent now. She developed bleeding while at a large family function the night prior and told her mother she had been assaulted by a cousin. The mother tells you she wants treatment for her daughter but no police contact. She is adamant. She does not want you contacting the police. So you're kind of in a predicament here. What do you do? Well, Poxo says that you must inform the police no matter what the mother wants. The mother may decide to tell the police she does not want an investigation, but that's a separate issue. You as a, a, a pediatrician must notify the police. We also need to get consent for any treatment, for the exam, and for obtaining a sexual assault evidence kit. And consent is very important. If the child is less than 12 years of age, legally the parent must give consent or refuse. If the child is 12 or older, they can give consent. 
But regardless, the age of the child, doesn't matter if they're 9 or they're 16, you have to have their permission. You can't force a child to get an exam, even if the mother or the parent is saying, I want that child examined. So legally, the consent is the parent or the child, but always you have to have the concurrent permission of the child. And documentation is very critical. Uh, and the guidelines, again, will take you through this very step by step and, and spell out exactly where the parent signs on the form. So what do you say to the mother? Well, I would suggest that you speak with her alone. Have your nurse take care of the child, take mother in another room, and talk to her. Using a very non-judgmental, open approach, ask her more about her concerns. What is it about reporting to the police that you find so worrisome? What do you think will happen? so you understand more of where she is, uh, where her fears lie. Uh, ask her uh, if, she's, if the father knows, if other people know, what, what are the consequences of the police getting involved? Uh, that's not gonna affect your decision, but it ne you need to be able to talk to her about that. And you also talk to her very gently about what would happen if the police were not notified. The cousin would in all likelihood assault somebody else or reassault the child, her daughter. So the safety of this child and other children is at stake. Again, we'd be actively listening, non-judgmental, get her feelings about it, but ultimately reiterate your legal obligation to notify police. And you would want to come back and keep focusing, Mother, on the central point, which is she needs to put the child's best interest as a priority and support the child any way she can. Right now, she's thinking about the family's reputation and the stigma. I understand that, but she has to support the child. That's the most important thing. So anything you can do to help her understand that and figure out a way to support her child uh, is going to help. Talking to the child, uh, you're going to want to talk to the child alone. So you'd explain to the mother that it's important for you to talk to the child alone so that the child will feel free to tell you information that they might otherwise be hesitant to say if mother was sitting right there. So you talk to the child, but keep in mind this child's been traumatized last night, and that is probably going to affect her behavior towards you, uh, her feelings about herself, and her, the way she understands what you say. So a traumatized child needs a traumatized, a trauma-informed approach. So think about this. This child may be feeling right now scared, ashamed. She may somehow feel guilty that she brought this on herself. She's afraid you're going to judge her. She may be angry at her mother, angry at the cousin. That anger may come out towards you. Or she may be very fearful, shut down, doesn't want to say anything to you because of the prior trauma. So her behavior has to be interpreted in terms of the trauma she's experienced. So a trauma-informed approach then uh, is victim-centered, and that is everything you do, all your decisions, all your activities, all your, um, your plans have to have the child's best interest as the primary focus. That's the first priority. Your wishes, the mother's wishes, law enforcement's wishes have to take second priority. The child's best interest has to be put first. You're aware of the impact of trauma and how that might affect the child, uh, and try to be as non-judgmental and open and empathic as you can, understanding the child's uh, predicament. It's really important for us to minimize the re-trauma that the child may experience while in the office. And how do we do that? We do that by not asking irrelevant questions, minimizing the number of questions about the event, and we go very carefully through the exam so the child is not traumatized by the exam. And finally, it's so important to empower the child. Think about it. The cousin has taken away all power from that child, has absolutely disempowered her uh, by sexually assaulting her. So now it's our job to give her that power back, and we can do that by giving her control, by giving her choices throughout the visit. Anytime you can, give her a choice and let her decide what's going on. It gives her a sense of power. So a trauma-informed approach really has three basic tenets. It it's, uh, concentrates on safety of the patient, on respect for the patient, and transparency. Now we all know that when you're in the, the child's in your office, they're very physically safe, but they may not feel psychologically safe. So it's important to try to build that sense of safety, and you can do that very easily by addressing some of their physical concerns. You could say, are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? Would you like a drink of water? Are you warm enough? Would you rather talk to me on this chair than on the bed? See, I'm giving her choices, uh, giving her control. And that shows that I care about her and how she's feeling. I take time to build rapport before starting in on the very difficult questions. I think it's also very important to demonstrate your respect 
by telling a child what you want to do and why you want to do it before you do it. So this is what I would say. You know, I'm going to ask you some questions about what happened last night. And the reason I'm asking those questions is because I need to know if there's something I can do to help you. That's why I'm asking the questions. And then I get her permission. Is it okay for me to ask those questions? You don't have to answer them. You can answer some questions or none of the questions. It's up to you. So what am I doing here? I'm giving her respect and I'm giving her choices. And then I say, after the questions, I say I'd like to do a head-to-toe exam. And the reason for that is, and I give my explanation, is that okay? Is it okay if I test for uh, a, this thing called HIV? And I want to ask her, her permission the whole way through. It's also very important and respectful to review the limits of confidentiality early on. You know you're going to have to share this information with law enforcement. So you don't want to get a lot of information from her, get her to tell you her deepest feelings and fears, only to betray her by saying, oops, I forgot to mention, I'm going to have to go tell somebody everything you just told me. So get out in front of that confidentiality issue immediately and say something along the lines of, when we talk together, you don't have to answer the questions, but when you do, I just want you to know, I'm going to try to keep what you say to me confidential, but I can't guarantee that. Other people may have to know, just so you know that before we get started. And that means she has control over what she tells you. Remaining very not calm and non-judgmental, what she tells you may be horrific, may be horrifying, uh, but you don't want to show that. You just be very calm uh, and just listen. And uh, avoiding blame. We all know we shouldn't blame our patients, but this is even more important because that 10-year-old is thinking, this is my fault. Whatever, I must have done something and brought this on myself. And so she's looking at you to blame her as well. So we don't want to give her any uh, hint that, that, that we think that she is to blame. Now let's talk really quickly about the pro forma, which is a, yeah, about a six-page document that's part of the guidelines, uh, and it takes you through every step of the way of your evaluation, from the consent with the signatures all the way to the end with referrals. Uh, and you fill this out as you're doing your evaluation or afterwards. But keep in mind, a trauma-informed approach is really important. If you look at this form, it is a daunting form. There are maybe 50 questions. Uh, and it would be very easy for you to start asking the questions, boom, 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 one after the next, after the next. You're not even having eye contact, you're just asking questions. Uh, and that becomes an interrogation. And we don't want the child to feel uh, alienated and sort of interrogated. So a better way, I would suggest, would be to sit back First of all, you ask the mother some of these questions. Get whatever information you can from the mother, which means you have to ask the child fewer questions. After you've gotten everything from the mother, you talk to the child and you say, can you tell me about what happened last night? Let's start when you got to the, got to the party. Tell me about that. And just let her tell you everything. And a lot of these answers will come out. And then you can circle back and ask, ask direct questions as you need to. Remember, Questions are interpreted all in the way you ask, and they can be easy questions or they can be very difficult questions. It's, it's the way you ask the question that's important. So instead of saying, ever been in this kind of trouble before? If you want to know whether she's ever had a history of sexual assault, you wouldn't say, ever been in this kind of trouble before, because that implies that she's gotten herself in trouble and it's her fault. So instead, you might say, has anything like this ever happened to you before? You would not say, well, certainly you told him to stop, right? That's a suggestive question. With that little right after the end, is suggesting the answer that you want. Not a good way of asking the question. What were you wearing is another question you'd want to avoid because that implies blame. That somehow what she's wearing uh, is to blame. That brought on the, the sexual assault. Uh, who else has done this to you is a leading question. We don't know that, that uh, anyone else has been involved, so we don't want to lead with new information. The exam and the diagnostic uh, evaluation are comprehensive, and again, the guidelines will take you through this, but basically, it's a head-to-toe examination and then a more detailed genital and anogenital examination. So you'd want to uh, document the child's affect and their overall appearance, as well as any medical findings you see, physical findings, and then you'd want to document injuries, and they may be genital injuries or extragenital injuries. Be sure you're comprehensive about that, so you'd want to include the location of the injury, the size, the color, the nature of the injury. Is it a contusion, abrasion, laceration? Uh, and then whether it is patterned or not, has any kind of pattern to it. So for example, you might say, 
the child has a five by three centimeter reddish blue round contusion over the right clavicle. There you go. Uh, something like that is very helpful. Keep in mind that with your genital exam, you do not need to do a speculum or bimanual exam unless there is a medical reason for that. If you suspect there's internal vaginal cervical trauma, then you would, but otherwise it's not part of the routine. So it's really an, an external examination. You may need to use uh, to gather forensic evidence depending on the nature of the sexual contact. Uh, if it was fondling his hand on her genitals, that's probably not going to lead to much forensic evidence, uh, and you wouldn't necessarily do a kit. But if it was penis to vagina contact, you would want to do a kit. You'd want to offer STI testing uh, and prophylaxis, HIV, etc., um, and a vaccination if needed. But none of this happens without the child's permission. You cannot, and we should not, hold down a child and force them to go through an exam. Uh, no restraints, no forcing the child. We need to either distract them and relax them enough so that they can cooperate or postpone the exam. You can have them come back the next day and often they'll be in a better position to tolerate the exam. The only exception to this would be if you have a medical emergency. The child's bleeding out, you have to do an exam. In that case, you would probably want to explain that to the child and if she is able to calm down enough, you could do the exam, but if not, you could use um, uh, sedation and do the exam under sedation. No two-finger test for virginity. Uh, just to be very clear, the size of the vaginal opening has nothing to do with prior sexual penetration. Absolutely no correlation. Uh, so that is not something that would be done. Keep in mind also, there may be no evidence of genital trauma. There have been several studies done looking at children who present uh, for evaluation after alleged sexual abuse. 95% of them have a normal or a nonspecific anogenital exam. Only about 5% of them have diagnostic findings. The reason is, there are a number of reasons why you could have a completely normal exam. One is the type of contact. Keep this in mind. If somebody uses their hand to touch somebody's genitals, they're not gonna cause any injury. That's not gonna show anything on exam. A penis in the mouth is usually not gonna cause any injury. The other uh, thing to consider is lubrication. If lubrication is used, a penis can go into the anus, the anus dilates, no trauma. Uh, same with the um, an adolescent hymen. Once puberty hits, the adolescent hymen becomes very distensible. And so you can have um, sexual intercourse, penile penetration, even forceful penetration without sustaining any injury. Now with many young children, I think that they have no real concept of what penetration means. A six-year-old has no idea. So if our 10-year-old says, yes, his penis was inside me, we don't really know what that means. And it probably means, in many cases, that the penis penetrated between the labia, so it's legally it's penetration, but just bumps up against the hymen, does not go through the hymenal opening into the vagina. So there's not full penetration. So therefore, there wouldn't be any injury. Sometimes children delay their disclosure. And if you have a delay of over two weeks or so, it's highly unlikely that any injury that was there would still be visible because things heal completely without scarring and they heal very fast. Again, the guidelines are gonna take you through forensic evidence collection, which you would consider depending on the type of contact and depending on the timing, if it's less than 96 hours since the event. And it will also take you through the various STI tests that you'll do and the prophylactic treatment, as well as emergency contraception. But beyond all that, we have to think of referrals. At the end, you've done everything, you pat yourself on the back, uh, you need to notify law enforcement, but you also need to think of other referrals. And one of those mandated, really major referrals is for mental health assessment. Most children are gonna be really traumatized by this and they need a mental health assessment. So keep that in mind. If you know somebody in your community, um, figure out who that person is and do what we call a warm handoff. Instead of giving the mother a piece of paper with the, with uh, the phone number on it and relying on her to call herself, get her permission and then call from your office and make an appointment for the parents and the child to see that counselor. It's a warm handoff. We're likely to get compliance that way. And then when you document, it's important to fill out that pro forma, that, that uh, six page document, using uh, ver uh, quotes whenever possible. When you're describing what the child told you, use verbatim statements as much as you can. Keep your, uh, your opinions objective and without bias. Avoid very or sort of emotional terms like heinous, and this was horrific. You want to leave that out, be very objective. 
Describe the injuries fully, and most importantly, keep in mind that your findings may be inconclusive and you need to explain why. So you may say, anogenital exam showed no visible evidence of trauma, but none would be expected in this setting. Or, it is very common to have no visible trauma, uh, even in the presence of child sexual abuse, for one or more of these reasons. And then you list lubrication, healing, uh, uh, distension, and uh, flexibility, etc. Uh, so make sure that you give a reason why you would not necessarily expect to see genital findings. Now, I don't want to end on a depressing note. I want to sort of uh, uh, end with optimism. Uh, there is a resource that is being developed for you as healthcare providers. Uh, and it represents a collaboration between the Child Abuse and Neglect and Child Labor Committee of the IAP and the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And it's called the Indian Child Protection Medical Professionals Network. And what it means is we, have, we are building a cadre of pediatricians and other physicians around India, everywhere around India. We're targeting all areas uh, and giving intensive uh, training on child sexual abuse and ongoing technical assistance so that these people can act as your local expert on child sexual abuse. So when you have a child come into your office and you think to yourself, I can't remember what that lady at the IAP conference was talking about, I don't know what to do. You can call your local expert, describe the situation and they can guide you through it. They can answer your questions. Uh, they can help you with the exam. They can even come and teach your staff about child sexual abuse. So they will be a local expert resource. Uh, the IAP is going to be putting together, we'll have on the website, <clears throat> the names of all these uh, local pediatricians uh, so that you can figure out who is nearest to you. So the IAP will get that information to you. But in the interim, we're building the website now. Please feel free to contact me at this email address and I can put you in touch with uh, the right person. At this point, I think I have about 3 minutes and 18 seconds for any questions, if you have them. Thank you.